Hello, everyone. My name is Padmini Nidamolu, and I'm the co-founder of Lean and Agile for Women. And this initiative is for women to come together, lean into each other, support each other, offer to the community, and seek from the community. And the basic pillars of Lean and Agile are spirals, the community groups, um, LEA 100, this interview is part of that initiative where we bring in phenomenal women, inspiring stories and motivation, motivational journeys um, to the community. And we also have Leah Next Gen, bringing on the next generation of leaders into lean and agile spaces and conference and organizational partnerships to ensure conferences and organizations are doing um, an explicit and an intentional effort uh, for women inclusion. So, uh, you know, that, that's the premise of Lean and Agile. And um, today, as part of LEA 100, one of the pillars, I'm really, really honored to introduce you to a phenomenal, enthusiastic leader who is an internationally known presenter on topics related to agile development, patterns, retrospectives, um, change process and the connection between the latest neuroscience and software development. And um, she's the author of numerous articles and five books. Um, uh, the latest is, is The Most Fearless Change, co-authored with Mary Lynn Mans. Her background includes university teaching as well as work in industry in telecommunications, avionics and tactical weapons systems. She is a serial keynote speaker. Um, she has written various articles and, and she's an author, a mentor, and, and just a phenomenal thought leader. It's my pleasure to welcome Linda Rising to LEA 100. Hi, Linda. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. I'm honored to be part of this. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you, Linda, for the kind words. Okay, so we, I have many, many themes to cover with you and I'm greedy to cover as much as I can. So I'll dive right in. Um, so my, my first thought here, Linda, is you have been a thought leader for decades now and uh, an active member of the international communities for several, several years. I would like to know what were some of the trends and patterns uh, in these spaces that you've observed as you were uh, kind of leading some of these efforts. And if you can please have at least few focus areas while you're talking about the trends and patterns. So I love patterns and it was late in my life that I learned that we all love patterns. It's what our brains do. So we all notice what we think are trends. So all I can say is what I notice. I don't know whether I'm telling you what actually happened or whether I'm making it up. But I can tell you what what I saw. Sure, please. And I think the, the primary thing is, especially when I talk to women, especially when I talk to young, enthusiastic women, just like you, is to assure you that things are getting better. I don't recall ever having a tremendous struggle at wanting to do anything. I mean, there were challenges, certainly, but I was never abused, I was never assaulted, I was never really se sexually harassed. I know there are lots of women who face terrible things. Yeah. I never had any of that. But there were enough times when I did feel slight gender discrimination, when I felt that I wasn't able to do everything I wanted to do, and that has gotten better over time. I don't think I would be where I am today at 77 years old. It would be impossible if the world were not more open to, first of all, women, secondly, older women. It just wouldn't have happened 50 years ago. Yes, there were a few older women who were contributors. Grace Hopper comes to mind but there were hardly any women who were involved in computer science or software development, whatever it is that you wanna call it at the time. I can recall going to early computer conferences and seeing really no women. Right. So things have changed. Things have gotten better. 
And there's also an increasing realization in the workplace that we have to pay attention to gender issues, other issues that would lead to increasing diversity. Most workplaces now discuss that, have people who are in charge of committees that deal with that. That would never have happened decades ago. It just wasn't a part of it. The focus was simply on the job, the qualifications for the job, and what you were going to bring to it, your talents and abilities, whether you were a woman or not, wasn't considered important. And I can remember my first job interview, I was asked by the guy on the other side of the table whether I was using any kind of birth control. That's illegal now. You yeah. wouldn't be able to do that. So that's the primary message I have for younger women is since you only see what you see is to say, from my point of view, things are getting better. I am optimistic. I am encouraged. I think the world is a better place. I'm not saying things are perfect, but I think the trends are definitely all the patterns are leading in that direction. They should all lead us to be optimistic and hopeful because the world is getting better. That's awesome. That is just so hopeful and so optimistic for all of us. And it's the truth. Yeah. I think it's the truth. Yeah. No, I believe. Thank you so much for sharing that. And um, you've also done some phenomenal work in the areas of organizational change, Linda, and that's your specialty. Can you share what some of the dysfunctions of an organization as you've experienced, as you've seen, um, and what are some of those dysfunctions an organization could suffer from? And I want to kind of bring a focal point here because there could be many dysfunctions. What would it be like if, if there is lack of diversity, maybe even more focal point of gender diversity, uh, what would that dysfunction look like? And um, what's your take on it? What's your perspective on that? I think the, uh, the biggest problem organizations face today in making organizational change is the belief, especially the belief on the part of high level executives and managers that they can make a timeline and they can say, I have a goal. I want the, the organization to be agile by, and they'll actually have a date. By June 2020, our entire organization is going to be agile. Not only that, but we're all going to be doing agile in exactly the same way. Right. We, we will have this process so well defined that we will all be on board with it, and we will all know exactly what our roles are. And it will be very clear and we'll be able to take advantage of all of the benefits Agile has to offer because they see the benefits. They want all of those benefits, but they think that somehow they can plan that out. Yeah. And unfortunately, what we know is organizations are complex adaptive systems and you can't plan out what's going to happen to them especially when that organization is made up of a diverse group of people. And now the diversity that counts is the diversity that lies along that population of adoption that Everett Rogers discovered decades ago, that some people embrace change. They love it. They're called the innovators. There are some who are open, but a little more reluctant, the early adopters. The, late, the early and late majority, the biggest chunk, well, they are really slow and they look to see what other people are doing before they even think about it. And then of course the laggards are never going to change. Now that's been true forever. It's hardwired. That diverse population that every organization faces kept us alive. When you say something is hardwired, that means it has evolutionary benefit. So if you think about it, what would have happened when we were sitting in the savanna tens of thousands of years ago and a couple of members of our very small tribe, usually about 150 people, would have come over the hill and said, we found some new fruit. It's delicious. We should all eat it. 
And at the time, we would all have been hungry. We were hungry most of the time. But would it have been a good idea if everyone had embraced that new fruit and had said, yes, let's all eat this fruit? Probably not. It would be better if oh, a couple of people would try it and now the rest of us will watch and we will see what happens to those people who eat the fruit. Yes, if they seem to make it through a couple of days, then a few more of us might try it, the early adopters. And now the early majority, they'll see, well, you know, after a couple of weeks, it looks like they're still okay. Maybe we might try this fruit. The late majority, well, they're very reluctant. They probably won't try it right away. And the laggards will never eat the fruit. And that diverse makeup of a population is what kept us alive. Mm -hmm. So when I talk to executives and managers about change and they say, well, Linda, isn't there some way we can get rid of all of these laggards and late majority and the, all those people who won't immediately jump on the bandwagon and go agile? And I say, listen, they may bring some valuable insight they may know some things about the organization. You should learn from them. You should embrace diverse opinions. If everyone all agrees about anything at the same time, there are plenty of famous business leaders who said, if we all agree, we should better go home and sleep on it because this is not a good thing. Yeah. It's not a good thing when we all rush to do anything. That's the primary dysfunction I see today, is that that's the goal, is that the high-level executive or the manager who sees some good thing wants everybody to be alike in their acceptance of it. It's a different kind of diversity. They don't embrace people who disagree with them. They don't regard those people as being valuable, as ha having anything to add. Yeah. When we get to the point where we realize that somebody who disagrees with us is a valuable uh, element of the organization. That's when we'll be able to make progress. It's only when we involve all of our opinions and all of our points of view that we'll be the best we can be. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great viewpoint. And um, that's more of a norm in the organizations these days to go agile and do it all at once, um, yes. not knowing the ROI. Yes, and, and I'm an agile fan. I'm an agile believer. But I still know that in every organization, there are gonna be people who resist that. Yeah. And that is a good thing. And that is something we should embrace. When we say we embrace change, we also need to embrace those people who are a little afraid of change because they have something, they have a point of view, they have an idea about this new thing, about the organization, about maybe even me, how I'm doing it, that I need to listen to that and I need to learn from that. I don't want to be happy if everybody agrees with me and says, oh yeah, this is a great idea, let's all do it. That's not necessarily a good thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point. And uh, I, I'm talking about organizations and how things are going and the dysfunctions, um, you know, takes me to the thought of, of really pausing and retrospecting, uh, you know, as a team, as an individual, as a program, et cetera. And you've done some phenomenal work in retrospectives space. So uh, in your viewpoint, what does it really mean to retrospect at individual team, program, enterprise level, at leadership level, not just what went well or you know, what can we do better, but what does it really mean to retrospect meaningfully? I think for me, it was a, a, an insight in a retrospective I was leading for an organization to suddenly realize in the middle that there was a um, 
a contentious individual who really wasn't too happy with the way things were going. And again, I was not willing to embrace his point of view. I kept thinking, well, he should join in. He should be just like everybody else. He should want to participate in this. And then we did an exercise that Norm Kurth talks about. It's called Offer Appreciations. And in it, people say, I mean, there are lots of ways of doing the exercise, but basically they say something about what other people in the room did in the last iteration the, to offer an appreciation, to offer a sincere thank you. Thank you for, and then they say specifically what it was and why they appreciate it, what it was that this person did and how it helped you. And as we did the exercise, this one contentious individual came in the circle and he raised his hand. He wanted a turn at offering appreciations. And he said, I just want to say thank you to everybody for putting up with me. I hadn't expected that. I, I don't know why he decided to do that, but it made me realize that if we talk about change and if we want people to be something better or different, there is no place in the way we work now for that to happen, except in the retrospective. Right. The retrospective offers a space where we can all come together and we can say, we may not be happy with the way we've been doing things in the past. I may know that I've been a contentious, cantankerous, disagreeable, not so nice person, but how can I be different? How can I change? Where is that gonna happen? The retrospective is the perfect place. It's the place where we can come together and we can say, I'm not so happy with the way things have been going with this team or with myself. I'd like to be better. I'd like to change. This, this is going to be now my point of departure. I think from now on, I'm going to try maybe, maybe to be not so cantankerous and so hard to get along with. And I'd like to change. I'd like to change if you'll help me change. It's the perfect place for change at all levels. It's where we can begin again. We can begin again after every iteration. That's the magic of Agile. We have the chance to begin again, I to be better. That. Yeah, let's begin again. I love that. That's just a, you know, a very creative way to look at it. Thanks for sharing that story. And then talking about stories, then Linda, um, you've authored five books. And, and that's, that in itself is a, is a Herculean task. It's, it's, a, it's a huge trajectory, right? Authoring five books takes a lot. And um, these books are a representation of your thoughts, your perspectives, your view of the system, your vision. And I, I have encountered, I've spoken to many women in our community, in our lean and natural communities who have great stories. I mean, they don't have to be uh, great thought leaders, but these are women with great stories, journeys and perspectives. But I also see a lot of apprehension and self-doubt uh, and imposter syndrome in them to share their stories, not necessarily in the form of a book per se, but even to write a simple article, blog, or even a note on, on, on social media, they, they have this apprehension and self-dialogue um, saying you might not be good enough or you, know, you might be perceived differently. I would like, to, I'm really interested to know what would be your message or what would be your thought to really get started on something when you want to do something? How can you break that internal barrier? Well, I have a the perfect answer. <laughs> awesome, I can't wait to hear. <laughs> One of the things the patterns community brought to software development was patterns. And how do you get those patterns? 
Well, only if people who have had an experience take the time and the effort to write them down. And that's not going to happen unless you have some kind of process that encourages people who don't have the time, who maybe don't have the courage, who don't believe that their experience is worthwhile to actually do the writing of the patterns. So what the patterns community did was they developed a process and it involved somebody to help you somebody to encourage you to write. That person is called a shepherd. Hmm. Now that process still exists, but now you can find it in many different situations. And in particular, in the Agile Conference in the US, there is a track called Experience Reports. Hmm. And when you present an idea for an experience report, you get a shepherd. And that shepherd does exactly what a real shepherd does. You become the sheep. You are the sheep and your shepherd will help you, will support you, will protect you, will encourage you, will give you feedback, will get you through the hard work of writing that very first experience report. Will not only help you write it, but will also help you prepare because you have to give a presentation of the experience report. So you're gonna write a paper and you're gonna write a presentation and you're gonna give that presentation at the Agile Conference. And your shepherd is with you every step of the way. And I have been a shepherd for many first time authors, first time presenters, many of them women, all of them terrified yeah. and watching them go through that process to hold their hand and lead them down that treacherous path and come out at the end smiling is one of the most rewarding Absolutely. experiences you could possibly have yeah. and so i'm going to suggest anyone anyone who has a good story that they think about submitting it as an experience report to the Agile Conference, getting a shepherd, having someone help them. It's, it's the best kind of pairing. We know there are so many benefits to pairing. It's the best kind of pairing because now you, you have someone who's on your side, someone who's there for you, someone who's going to give you feedback, that's specifically designed to help make you better. We all need that. We all need that. And but we need especially first time, especially first time authors, they they really need it. Yes. And I think I think we should have more of that available, but that's one very good place to go. Yeah. And and when we are talking about you know, just partnership or, you know, being an agilist is um, now we have something called spirals where we have this group of women coming together. But but what you just explained is what we need more of. Somebody to yes. shepherd, somebody to, you know, hold hands yes. and really, you know, end up on the other side, but stronger. And, um, you know, yeah, that, that, that's a very powerful um, story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I guess when you're talking about, you know, uh, your experiences with shepherding, you know, the speakers, you know, new speakers, new voices uh, who are apprehensive. And uh, again, just in, in that space, we see that there's a lot of apprehension from, from anybody new to, to really even venture going to a conference, applying to speak at a conference because you're already intimidated by the line of speakers. So you would be already apprehensive that I'm not gonna make into that line of speakers. So the conferences uh, or you know anybody in the summit organizers should intentionally make space for women to talk. In your experience as a conference speaker for decades, what are your thoughts on having the conferences make that women inclusion pledge as part of their organizing? I would say that right now they do. I, and I know a lot of conference organizers, and they are always happy 
to have first time speakers who have a good story, who have something valuable to share. They are all encouraging that my experience is that I go to a lot of conferences and I see a lot of first time presenters and that the organizers are happy to have them there. It's good to have somebody else besides the same old, same old people speaking all the time. We need to hear these new stories. We need to bring in new people. And I, I, I was just at a conference in Cologne, Germany, and I think almost everybody there was a new speaker. Wow. So this was a kind of an unusual conference, but they went out of their way to bring in people who were brand new. But that's not so exceptional. I, I think there are several flavors of conferences. There are some that are run by professionals that uh, lean more toward experienced presenters. But there are a lot of conferences now. I mean, Agile has brought that to the table as well. Every yeah. city has an Agile conference. Nashville has an Agile conference. And the speakers are mostly people who live there people who live in Nashville or Cologne or Taiwan or whatever the city happens to be, that way they can bring in local stories that will mean more to the attendees because most of the attendees are local as well. It becomes a local conference in every sense of the word. The conference in Cologne was amazing because the, the organizers even had their parents they weren't, they weren't speaking, but they were there. They were handing out brochures and, and they were helping at lunch. And, you know, I kept looking at these older people and I thought, well, so I don't feel like I'm the oldest person there. And I went up to them and they said, oh, no, no, we're not. We're just helping. We're the parents. We're the parents of the organizers. Yeah. I thought, that's awesome. That is awesome. Yeah. <laughs> So that, that, a, it was a family. It was a family adventure. Yes. Yeah. 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 Fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, we need more of that to yes. happen. And um, can you share a pivotal, I would say, a moment or a situation or a learning aha moment in your journey so far? I think probably the most significant is when I started writing the book Fearless Change with my friend Mary Lynn. We met at a patterns conference and we were both trying to do the same thing, which was introduce patterns and agile into organizations. And we had what we thought was insight to say, you know, there might be patterns for introducing patterns. <laughs> and as we started writing them, I thought, because I was a technical person at the time, I was interested in the design patterns. I considered myself a very technical person, a designer, developer. I thought that's what the patterns were going to be. They were going to be technical patterns. Something to do with how do you convince people that this is a good idea? I thought that was a technical topic. And I didn't know anything about psychology. I mean, I'd had a course in psychology, but that was it. I didn't know anything about psychology, sociology, evolutionary biology. I didn't know anything. And as we began to write that book, and I began to learn about those things, I realized these are not technical patterns. These are patterns about the people. These are patterns about the people in the organization and how they think and what they're afraid of and how you can help them. It's not about beating up on people or convincing them. It's about being open to listening to where they are and trying to understand how your good ideas can help them. It's totally different from what I thought it was going to be. It was a 
an enormous insight for me. Changed my life. I have not, I have not looked back after that. I don't, I don't consider myself a technical person anymore. I consider myself a person who's interested in psychology and sociology and organizational change and all those things I knew absolutely nothing about 20 years ago because it took us 10 years to write the book and then another 10 years to write the second book. We spent, Mary Lynn and I spent 20 years of our lives writing those two books because we had to change. We had to change. As we learned, we had to change. As we learned about change. That's phenomenal. <laughs> that is phenomenal. <laughs> yeah, uh, and, and, and thanks for bringing that out uh, as one of your pivotal moments, Linda. Thank you. And, and, and when, you, when you said you had to change, what are some of the superpowers that you always you know, swear by? What are some of the strengths that you always carry with you? I'll never have it figured out. Oh. Just when I think I have it all figured out, I learn something else and everything shifts and I have to start over. And I think that means that I'm still alive. When that stops happening, that means you're not alive anymore. And I want to stay alive as long as I can. We want you to stay alive for a long, <laughs> long time. <laughs> oh, like you, okay. And um, as we wrap up then, Linda, it was such, such a lovely, such a, you know, learning experience for me during this interview. Um, as we wrap up, what would be a, a message or, um, you know, a quote maybe, or something that, that you want to kind of convey to our community? I am ordinary. I'm not a genius. I didn't go to MIT or Stanford. I did go to a lot of universities. I do have a PhD, but they were state schools open to anyone. I'm really just like anybody else. Anything I've done, anybody could do. My goal is to always have someone say, ah, Linda, you're my hero because you could do it, I could do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, that's a lovely, reassuring, optimistic message. That was fantastic and phenomenal. Thank you so much, Linda, for not just this interview, but for everything that you do for the community and standing as a role model and um, truly showing that if you can do, any of us can do. Yes, and that's true, I believe it. Yes, yes. <laughs> we wanna believe it too. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. This, this, this was one of the best. My pleasure, my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>